All right, we're live. Okay, let me refresh. Right. There, yay! Let me refresh. <laughs> there, yay! Let me refresh. All right. There. All right, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna reboot. We're gonna reboot the show. Right. For those of you who <laughs> might think this is Groundhog Day, no, it's Workflow Wednesday. Hi, I am your host, Art Aldridge, and I want to just get a couple of plugs out of the way right off the get-go. So this is a webinar that my company, Otech TV, is producing in conjunction with my podcast, This Week in Production. And that was a podcast in which Dan Montgomery who is the founder of Imagine Products, was on as a guest. And we were talking about NAB and how the whole COVID thing blew it up and what was next for him and how he was reaching out to customers and announcing new products. And long story short, he asked me if I would be willing to do a little workflow video for him. I said I would, but I said, since all my crew is home, sequestered, you know, not doing a whole lot. I said, maybe we can do this as a live demo. So we're trying this as a live demo. And not only, not only am I presenting, but I'm your technical director today. So things are a little nutty over here. But let me introduce the group. From Imagine Products in your lower right-hand corner, I have Michelle Maddox. And Michelle was like to say a few words. Hi guys. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be doing this. We've been in business about 30 years now and workflow has always been at the front of our minds when developing products. Um, we focused on keeping everyone organized and maintaining good workflow and data management. So we're really excited to be a part of this and can't wait to see what, what the day brings. Okay, cool. So let me introduce my crew, and uh, you, there'll be some information how you can reach out and contact us if you need to. But from Massachusetts, Cape Cod, Tom Chartrand, and from New Jersey, Joe Diacchino. And both of these guys work on my crew. We've been together for many, many years. These guys are not just DITs. They're really, they run their own businesses, and they do all aspects of production. We're also all part 107 pilots, so we fly drones and we do all kinds of fun stuff. So we're going to take questions. You could tweet them. You can put them in the Facebook comments. You can put them in the YouTube comments. We're going to try to get to them all. I see there's a whole bunch of comments in there now. Great. Um, so let's talk about media management. And this is a, a workflow that I've been using for quite some time, but I think before you can understand what I do, you need to understand what the job is that I'm being tasked with. So the bulk of my work is doing corporate golf outings. And these are usually with a PGA professional, and we do about 10 of them a year. They're typically two days where we roll into town on day one, we set up, we uh, prep media. Tom has a whole process to get the cards and stuff ready to shoot. We shoot B-roll that day. We fly drones. And then uh, on day two, we play golf with uh, the pro and these business execs. I shoot these jobs with anywhere between six and ten cameras. I'm heavily invested in Par Panasonic Varicams. Those are my A cameras. But I also have some smaller P2 cameras that are right on glide cams. We also have some GH5s that we use. We have drones, and every now and then, even I'm getting away from them, we got some GoPros. And by the end of this two-day job, I generate between a terabyte and two terabytes of data. And 
in order to process that data, I carry two DITs with me. And Tom being one of them, the other DIT who's not on this webinar is uh, Nick Harlick. And uh, those two guys handle the bulk of my offloading on site. So what are my objectives on shoot day? Well, I want to have accurate metadata. And this means data that is stamped into every single frame of footage that we shoot on the P2 cameras. So things like the golfer name, the foursome name, the hole that we're playing on, perhaps the golf course information, and most importantly, the camera operator who's running that camera. So I want accurate metadata, and that's one of the things that Tom's, Tom does. I don't want to lose any clips, and that may sound trivial, but it happens. It's happened to me not too often, but you don't want to have that occur repeatedly. So I take steps to prevent <clears throat> lost clips. We also have a fair amount of expensive media, be it Express P2 cards, regular P2 cards, Compact Flash, SD, micro SD, Inspire, SSD types. They're expensive, right? So we don't want to lose any media. And so we have a system in place for that that Tom will talk about. And then the last two pieces are really the critical part, which is making sure the footage is archived. And I make two types of archives. One is the camera native format. So in the case of P2, this means MXF. I don't want quick times necessarily because in case I have to share footage with Avid editors or some other editing platform that doesn't like, you know, ProRes, I want to have camera native media. So one archive is strictly camera native. The second archive that the second DIT Nick is working on is a Final Cut project. And this is really in preparation for editorial. And his job is to ingest all the media, sync all the cameras, sync all the audio. And that step happens on site before we wrap for the day. And these are all things that I need to have happen before we leave. Because if they don't, things can get sideways. So my quick keys to success in managing this type of job are consistency. And it means consistency in how I'm preparing for the job, making sure I have all the data, the equipment, the crew. Most of the crew is repeat hires, guys that I've used for 15 years who do all these jobs with me. Not that I don't hire any locals, but usually not in key positions. I also have redundancy in a lot of the production resources, and this means equipment, spare cameras, spare card readers, spare hard drives, but also redundancy in my crew in the sense that if one of my camera ops for some reason can't work like uh, injured or sick, I have other people on the crew who can step in because they're multi-skilled. So that redundancy has helped me actually in more times than I'd like to recall. But the last key for me to making a successful shoot is documentation. And again, Tom will walk you through some of these steps. But we document everything. Going back to my film days, I think, when I used to shoot 16 mil neg at NYU and you turn your film into the lab, you had to have a camera report. And this is really, I think, where that started for me. And this means documenting every aspect of the shoot, any audio notes, any metadata notes that were wrong, anything that happened in production. We had bad white balance on one of the cameras or we lost a backup recorder halfway through. Any of those notes get documented and stored with the, the bundle. And that's all part of the very important process of having a successful job. So now I bring in my crew. In the center, Joe Diacchino. Hi. And on the right, Tom Joe? Chartrand. Hi. So Tom, hey, Tom. we're going to start with you first. 
And okay. you handle most of the day of shoot prep day stuff. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you and you can walk through the process. Sure. Like you said, it's a, it's a two day shoot, but in actuality, by the time we get on site, um, it's really a 30 hour process right around there. We've got, it's a little over a day. Um, and so the redundancy is important, but organization and reliability. And that's something that we've, we've built over the years is this workflow with a little bit of right reality, um, reliability. <clears throat> um, so like you said, the goal is to have uh, redundant copies of the final cut library and a raw footage archive. And those archives consist of everything from audio masters, drone video, multiple on-course cameras, time-lapse cameras, GoPros, uh, and even professional photography from the, uh, from the event, from the, the client. Uh, so there's a lot of different media coming in and a lot of different sources. So really, things can really get to go sideways when everything's coming in from all different directions. So over the years, we've developed this system of tracking everything. And it really, it gets down to an Apple numbers document that, uh, as well as some other um, useful useful tools that we've had to, to go with. But uh, in short, this is, this is the workflow. You know, our job can be a multitasking nightmare. So on the uh, day of the shoot, I inventory all the cards. There's times when we may not get to look at those cards from the last event a month or two prior. So we go through all of them, make sure they're still there. And I create a list of the express cards, all the different cards that we have. Sometimes um, I'll bring in some of mine, somebody else will, depending on the size of the event and how many people are there. And um, I go through them and then I make sure they're properly formatted. You see in this list here, we've got the serial numbers of every P2 card. And that's a really nice utility is that we're able to use Panasonic's P2 formatter. And that allows us to confidently format the cards, know that they're um, gonna be good and ready to go and use that serial number as the card name. Um, a lot of shooters have been on, on jobs where you've got a million SD cards and everyone of them may have no name as their as their name. So what's key for us, first of all, is having unique serial numbers that we can back everything up to. Um, and with that, I take those serial numbers, they're formatted, and I, we have another page in our document where I will assign all those cards to a particular shooter. And we'll have the foursomes laid out, we'll have who the shooter is, and these elements here with time in, time out, Time out is the day of the event. Time in is when they come in during the course of the day. And I'll talk a little bit about how we track them coming in. But that's really the most important thing is to have that part organized. Um, and also metadata, like Art talked about. Um, a big part of it is being able to um, get these libraries built over the course of one event and being able to track what's where. So Nick, the other DIT, can build his library make the multicam clips and know that the footage is matching what is on that metadata. So there's a handy app called Up that uh, Imagine Products did way back, I think in the P2 logger day, they uh, made a handy utility where we can create metadata files and they have the shooter, they have this user clip name, which in Final Cut passes through to the QuickTime generated. So you can literally in your timeline see and organize things by the user clip name, which will have that appended to the beginning of the name of the, of the clip. So we see group one, the foursome leader, AAA is the shooter, and he's on the green camera. You also get information like where the event is, what it is, where the uh, what the name of the club may be. And also in the memo field, we put all members of the foursome who's playing just in case we lose a piece of document that we need during their interviews. We know in group one, there was Aldrich, Chartrand, Diakino, and of course, Mr. Lita. So that's always important to have and uh, get in the cameras. So on the day of the event, everybody gets a plastic bag with their assigned P2 cards an SD card with their metadata on it. And then they also get Manila folders with custom labels. Because what happens is, as we said, it's a really short turnaround. So as the event starts right from the beginning demo or the PGA Pro presentation, we're getting cards back that we want to archive and then pass along to the ingest process. So those come back in those bags, we have everything and the workflow starts. So during there, 
the um, cameramen load the metadata onto their onto their cameras, and they'll shoot the event back as that happens. And so another part of our numbers document is the card return. And this all happens throughout the course of the event. And we've created this color coding system so that Nick and I know what stage we're at. So it's really helpful. I'll get a card back and I will log it, note it that it came back to, on the shooter and mark it in red because I haven't started offloading it yet. And this goes back to a time when we used to work off of the same drive. When drives were slower, we were, uh, you know, forced to have to try to work off the same media and so that now nowadays drives are so much faster we're able to work much faster in fact we use these um, i don't know if you can go to it art i wanted to introduce it the owc envoy pro ssd drives so we each have a, a raid one so two of these rated together and their read write speed uh, alone on thunderbolt 3 is 2500 megabytes per second super fast i think it takes a little hit on the raid one but they've performed really really well so I mark them red, and when I start ingesting them, I'll mark them yellow. So Nick knows that it's in process, the card hasn't been put down, there's nothing he can grab yet. And as I finish them, I'll mark them green, and they'll either go next to him or they'll be on the drive tagged green. And this numbers document is a collaborative document, so I'm able to share it with him on site. He may be a table over from me. So it's nice. It updates in real time. We're both doing it and uh, we can make notes with each other. Once in a while, a cameraman might get the metadata wrong. And so we'll make a note in the comment section here. Somebody maybe had the wrong foursome and I'll make a note when I catch it because I check every card that comes back in Final Cut. And if it's the wrong metadata, I'll let Nick know and he can make a note in the Final Cut change some scene and put some comments in there. So this follows it through. And what's really nice is this document follows the edit through all the way to our archivist, Joe, and he'll tell you more about that later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so again, our, our goal is to have, whoop, zooming the wrong way, um, everything archived at the end of that long day. Um, and it gets hairy at the end. You know, it can be a workflow nightmare as the end of the day comes and cards are coming in, cameramen are coming in and they're, how did my shot look? How was my exposure? What's going on? And I'm getting cards from the audio guy. I'm getting pictures from the photographer. That's where this, this document really, really shines. And um, when you get to the offload process, we use Imagine Product Shop Put Pro. And what's there is just confidence and reliability because it just always works. It's, it's um, a simple user interface and it, um, it's clean and simple and really shines. So there's some hey, Tom, certain, yes. Excuse me one second. We're gonna try yeah. to take a live question here. Because hey, you someone bet. was asking, Alex was asking, can you go over what raid levels and what all that means? Sure, sure. Well, I can go over ours. You can, you know, find out what they are. Raid zero is when you put the drives together to work in line and work as one drive and get even faster throughputs. But we use a raid one. And what that does is it's basically writing the same information to both drives at the same time. So on the computer, it looks like one drive, but it's actually two drives in an array and it's mirroring that information. So the purpose of that is when the event is done, somebody walks with one slice of that raid and somebody else walks with the other slice of that raid. They may be traveling to two different destinations, but we know it's another form of confidence that that data is backed up. It's somewhere safe. If it gets lost, it's not going to the same place. So it's two mirrored copies of the same amount of data. Thank you, Alex, And that's, that's that the reason why we do it. Great, great. Um, but getting to ShopPut Pro, it allows you to work with those drives. It allows you to take your data, double check it, put it in different places in a clean, simple interface. And um, you have your sources, you have your destinations. And that's what really makes it go fast is we'll have different types of destinations. We'll have our P2s, media with all of the um, metadata. We'll sometimes have the drone shots, audio, all of those masters go in a different section. All of our proxy media goes in a different section. And what's really nice is we're able to use that serial number that's so important to pass through. 
And again, like Art said, if something has been corrupted, lost, left, that card still lives in its given uh, Pelican box. And we can always go back to that by researching the document, finding out where that particular media was that had that metadata. And it's on card, say, 1368. So as part of our offload process, we use um, any number of different types of, a, whoop, any type of a number of different types of presets for offloading, but we use folder naming and folder naming or the card name, uh, which is the serial number of that card. But there's a lot of different options. Auto numbering, if you're on one job and you just want one card logged after another, the date, different job identifiers. And you can also append some of that information with custom text suffixes. So we may have one card that gets reused because we needed to use it on, on the second day after B-roll. And we're able to say, all right, we're using this on B-roll day two, and that card name will get appended with this. So we always know, and we make that note on the, uh, on, on, whoop, right in here. That'll get noted here. This particular one got appended with Alt-T, S-D, Alt-T. So we're able to take care of those different naming conventions and follow them and track them. And uh, let's see. We have and another the other question. Neat... You may have gotten yeah. to this. This question is from Alan. Okay. I don't know how to say that last name. I don't know if you talked about it, but we use a, a specific type of uh, verification on our jobs. I did not yet. Right, right. So uh, Shopit Pro gives you a ton of different ways of doing your um, verifications on site. When I'm out on site, I use file size verification. And part of the reason for that is I check the card when it comes in. I check my offload when it's done. And I want to know that when it's done, you know, did something bonk out? Did it match the file size of the card? And it goes over to our DIT editor right away. So if something's wrong, he knows um, and can check that out. He can check the archive. He can check the uh, the P2 card. And Joe will get into that a little bit as well because he uses some of the different verifications, the different types of checksum verifications that are in there. But they're all included, very deep. Um, the only thing is we take a time hit on the job if you have to do a real deep checksum verification and it slows down the workflow. So um, I like to think that the file size comparison is sufficient because we have other ways of checking and making sure that that data made it all the way. And it starts with the file size and we go and we check. Great. Thank you, Alan, for that question. And uh, one other thing is being able to assign where this info goes is so helpful. The drone will get assigned to a different drive on in there. So it, it gives you the ability, each of these different presets to select a different drive to offload to, or even a different subfolder within that drive. So it really lets you put the media that you want into the place that it needs to be. Um, and again, that's all verified on our document. Um, and when it gets there, you are notified of a report that I had open. <laughs> um, let me see if that still lives here. And of course not. It's just a live but demo. Don't worry about it. It's just a live demo. We can always start over. Um, <laughs> but coming right up, it is on that data. We get a report that goes with your offload. And that live report looks a lot like this. So it you can have it listed with previews of the data. It gives you everything that backed up. It tells you when, what, shows you what was there. And so when it gets to that archive process with Joe, he's able to really dig deep if he needs to find something. And again, Joe's going to get into some of that on his post side. But as far as that goes, once we've completed the job, we verified everything's there right down to the end of the day with the photos, all of the audio masters. We've done the Zach's conversions and made that so that Nick is able to make his multicam Final Cut library. And that's usually about 7.30 at night, 6.30, 7.30 at night on the end of the uh, job. Everybody can go their separate ways and this project is ready to edit without having to recall a whole lot going on. And uh, to me, that's the beauty of this workflow using all these different tools. Thank you, Tom, very much. Now I turn to Mr. Joe, 
who's been waiting patiently for his <laughs> turn to talk. Hello, so, everyone. Joe, you're handling you, – so sometimes you're on site doing DIT with Tom or sometimes in place of Tom. But usually you're on the back end. You're right. getting a split of the RAID data. Mm -hmm. And you're archiving it to LTO tape, which for me is my safety net. I know that if yeah. something goes wrong, because I've got live data on RAID drives and the mirrors from the field, and I've got it in a lot of places, but the only reliable archival solution for me and for my client is LTO data tape. So talk. Talk through your end of the workflow, please. Sure. So agreed that the LTO tape is by far the best master that we have. And as you accumulate data over time, there's no way that you have enough spinning rate arrays to house all this data. So um, some, like Art said, sometimes I'm on the shoot, sometimes I'm not on the shoot. And that brings about some, some different challenges uh, when I'm not on the shoot because um, I have to figure out what all this data is. And while they shoot with very consistent hardware, sometimes there's little pieces in there that uh, are unique for the job. And um, you just have to, you have to really understand the consistency of the job. So the first thing I'd like to start out with at least is the tool set that I use to archive uh, the jobs from the, the SSD or the spinning media to the LTO tape. So, the first thing is an SSD, uh, which is a RAID slice of all the project media. So I know at that point, there's no discrepancy between what was shot and what I have. It's a RAID slice. It's an identical copy of a RAID 1. Um, I have a Mac OS machine uh, with my LTO installed. Um, I use a high bandwidth RAID array. Um, this allows me to uh, make a copy of that RAID slice and also, which I'll get into at the end, to recover that data set back out from the LTO once everything has been put onto that tape media. Uh, I use Apple numbers uh, for the spreadsheets and I also use Dropbox to share the assets between the team members. Uh, the LTO drive that we've chosen to use is an M-Tape uh, LTO drive, which is a Thunderbolt 2, uh, 2 connectivity. And um, between the My LTO and the M-Tape LTO, um, LTO 6 drive, it's been very consistent. So I like to think of my process as having five stages that encompass the LTO archive process. Uh, the first stage is getting to know the assets. And when Tom leaves the shoot, I get, like we had mentioned, a, a RAID 1 slice of that data. So I know that I don't have the only copy. If um, if I do, then you know, clearly I make a, a backup of that. Um, all the assets are identical to on the shoot, so I don't have any um, reservation that what I'm getting is some a partial copy. Uh, I need to verify the integrity of those assets prior to any long-term storage of uh, data being written to the tape. So I use the P2 serial report that Tom mentioned as the primary reference for all of the media that's on that SSD. Uh, I need to know the file types that I'm working with, whether that's uh, drone footage, proxy media, audio, whatever that is. I need to know all the different genres of, of, of files. Uh, I have to open up and find out if all the Final Cut 10 libraries are either self-contained, are they reference libraries? Um, I need to determine if all the media inside of the Final Cut 10 libraries are online. Uh, if any media is offline, clearly I stop I contact Tom and reference that P2 serial report, which is uh, invaluable for both on-site and off-site. Um, at the end of that stage, I need to be confident that all the files are present from the shoot and that I verified the integrity of most of those files. Um, the second stage is asset organization for the offload. So now that all the assets, assets have been verified via the offload spreadsheet, and physically opening most of them, I organize the media and assets for offload. I determine what type of assets belong together. I keep the self-contained Final Cut 10 media libraries on blunt tape. 
Um, I also, if we're using referenced media libraries, I use uh, one tape to keep not only the Final Cut 10 reference media database, but also the master media that it's referencing. I need to know the file types like the audio, photography, drone, time lapse, uh, the proxy media, camera backups. Um, I need to know the capacity of the LTO 6 tape that I'm using, which is two and a half terabytes of native storage. Um, and I need to determine based on the data set, because like Art was saying, um, he accumulates, we accumulate around two terabytes, but when we also have a Final Cut library in that mix or on different shoots, we will accumulate much more of that. So tape spanning is not out of the question. So the third stage, after we're done with that asset organization for offload stage, is documenting the LTO process. And that, for me, that means using a predefined metadata set. So just like Tom was saying, about consistency in using consistency across the board to verify integrity, we I also use that same logic on the back end. And that classifies the unique qualities of the shoot or the project that we're working on. Um, it also classifies the tape itself. So how do we find this tape in the larger pool that of tapes that we're generating over time? So, you know, in the beginning, 10, 15 tapes is not a big deal, but now that we're up to 20, 30, 40 tapes, we need to know what tape, what is on that tape um, and get to it quickly. So some of the metadata that I use, um, some of the metadata that I use for my master spreadsheet is the tape serial number. So this is a unique six digit number that is never to be repeated on any other tape. So I personally use the first two digits of that six digit is the year archive. So for 2020, it would be 20 for the last two digits of 2020. And the last four digits are the number of the tape written this year. So for example, a 200001 numbered tape would be the first tape of 2020. Um, the tape serial number is really important because it gets mounted on your desktop. So when you mount the LTO tape with the LTFS architecture, uh, that's the number that you see on your desktop. So it's the quote unquote hard drive name. The second is the job name or the tape name. And the tape name is uh, typically prefixed with um, year, month, and day in a number string. So 2020-01-22 would be January 22nd of 2020. And this is the date when the project was archived. Um, the body of that, that next is the name of the job. So that is the name advertised when the tape is opened in my LTO. So both the tape serial number and the tape name are very important to get right and stay consistent. The tape contents, are, is the third variable that I use consistently. And that describes the projects, the media types, and the nested directories on the tape. This documents the names and the attributes of the media. So tape is very linear, unlike a hard drive. So if, God forbid, there's any issue with data that's written either before or after a certain data set, we'll know linearly what is written where on that tape. The fourth, oh, uh, zoom out to zoom in, I guess. The fourth variable is this notes. And notes explains the offload logic that we've used. So it explains the sequence in which the data was written to the LTO, um, if the tape was uh, spanned, if the job was spanned over multiple LTO tapes, it would be classified as like one of, two of, three of, and you know, with the last number being however many tapes we have. Um, and any unique characteristics or anomalies that have maybe happened in the archive. The last variable that I use very consistently is the offload verified variable. So the answer to this is always yes or no, and uh, which I'll get into at the back end of the process. It's when a project is finished archiving the LTO, we need to write that data back to the drives so that we can verify that the LTO data set is identical to the original data set that was used to put the data onto the LTO drive. So 
In this case, we're going to go to my Altio and just kind of show you some of the features of, of the software. So the first thing we want to do when you get a tape, any LTO tape, it's not formatted. So we need to format this LTO tape. So you would go up to the deck controls here and you would go to format. Um, like I had mentioned, the tape serial number is the... Can you zoom, Joe, uh, please? Oh, yes, sorry. The tape serial number is the last two of the year and the number tape that was written this year. So in this case, it would be 2020-0122. The tape name, excuse me, is the name of the job. So uh, this would be 2020-0122-GFNY. Um, this would be uh, a specific name of the project. The, I never enable compression. It's just not recommended on video assets. So I just get out of that. Uh, the tape, uh, I also always choose the re force reformat tape. And that just allows the tape to be reformatted in a, in, a, in, a, in a more consistent way between the computer and the tape drive. So in this case, I am not going to format the drive because it takes a little bit of time. But what I'm going to do is, is just mount an existing tape. And you can hear the, the tape uh, working in the background over my shoulder here. Um, no, we can't hear that, Joe. Oh, no? no it's no. not loud at all. No, I, I live in a server room, so this is, this is fairly quiet, actually. <laughs> so some of the other variables why that's, while that's mounting um, that I use is... In the, in the job options menu, I choose optimize drive use, which optimize the, the writes onto the LTO drive. So this is really important so that the drive isn't jogging back and forth, back and forth to write data on it. The other thing that I use is the checksum verification. So I use this specific 64 checksum um, option and this is in addition to the LTFS write verification process that happens by default. Can you screen zoom, Joe? Sure. So moving on to the report options, just like Tom uses the report options to verify his on-site offload, I need to verify that what I've done from a, a data standpoint is, is verified um, as well. So. I choose to use a PDF uh, summary report, and that just allows me to have a standard report in a uh, PDF format that lives on that tape. So if we ever have to reference the fact that uh, did this in fact go onto the drive properly, um, we have that as a, as a check and balance. So zooming out here. This is uh, the tape, uh, and then this is the number that you have given it. So in this case, I'm gonna open up the tape just to kind of show you what that looks like. So I did one offload for this GFNY project. Go ahead and zoom, please. Yeah. And it not only has the report folder, but it also has the project. So what does that project look like if, um, something like this. So this tells you the name of the job, the final status of the job, how big off the offload is, the verification type. I also put my information in there so that if there's any discrepancy with the end client about how it was offloaded, they can certainly give me a call and let me know or have me answer any questions for that matter. And people from offload, YouTube are going to be calling you now as well perfect awesome great um i also it also documents the os version and some of the other qualities of the of the of the machine that we're using just in case there's an os discrepancy between um, the software that we're using and, the, and the, the os so so after all this is done after we've written the data to the tape and we've verified that the data has been on the tape and 
you know, we've done all of our check and balance. I do one other check and balance, which is I eject the tape. I write protect the tape, which is that little slider on a, um, on a tape or, you know, a piece, other piece of media. And that's really important because if you're recovering the data from the LTO back to a hard drive and say a power outage happens, that write protect is, in, is, is so critical because if there's any type of, of write going on on that tape, which there shouldn't be, but if there is any, then that data could potentially be corrupt. I've, I've unfortunately been in that circumstance where uh, I was doing some tests with an LTO tape and a power outage happened and um, it was totally unexpected and something happened to the integrity of the tape. So that write protection is literally the first thing I do after everything's been put back on the tape. So after that, I update the LTO spreadsheet with all of those variables and potentially some other variables depending on the job. And inside the LTO jacket, I put the tape name and the serial number just as another reference so that there's a jacket that lives with the tape and they're, they're married and you know there's no misunderstanding of where this tape came from. Or um, sometimes if the job is a small isolated job, I'll even put that, I'll put that report, I'll fold it up and I'll put it in the jacket so that the tape and the reports from a metadata standpoint all live together. So that's essentially the, the offload. And I will say this, that the true test of your job, Joe, is when I call you up and go, I need to restore something. <laughs> and yes. I go down to the bank and I get the tape and I bring it to you and you unarchive it and then it all works. It because does. That's the, that's the fuzzy logic part that many people don't test is the restore. Agreed. It's easy and you never to, really know. It's easy enough to assume that you're getting the material archived to the tape. Just assume, but not always, right? Because there's a couple of gotchas, you know, with illegal characters and, and naming. And uh, my LTO does a very good job of trying to simplify that that process. But it's not always perfect in terms of, you know, archiving it and then restoring it and having it be functional. Agreed. I mean, even though that the MyLTO software is not only very simple to use, and the beauty about it is that moving between Shopa Pro and MyLTO when I am on site helping Tom uh, doing the DIT work is that it's it's seamless in between the two. So it's, it's really nice in that regard. But there are a lot of little things that, you know, time... Um, Time irons out there, and I, I, we, I, like you had said in the very beginning. I mean, we have a really, really good team, and we work really well together because we know everyone is looking out for each other. And there's no, like, as the process moves down the line, everyone is really checking and balancing each other's work just for pure consistency, and it's it's been super helpful over time. Now right. I'm gonna pull right. the show back of, in. Yeah. How are we doing? We got any comments or questions on? I think I'm getting Facebook ones, but I'm not sure if I'm getting others. Do we have anything Great. that yeah. is coming in? Um, I've gotten a few questions about the difference between my LTO and pre roll post, which I just kind of addressed briefly on YouTube. Um, but I can tell you guys here pre roll post is another one of our applications um, that does archiving, just like my LTO. The main difference is the retrieval process and the searchable database. My LTO does not create. Uh, a database of all the tapes that are made, but pre-roll post does. So if you want to talk to us more about what the differences are, what your archive needs are, what your setup is, we can kind of help direct you in, you know, what we think might be the best course of action there for you to take. Cool. Any other questions? One thing I will say about working with Imagine products, because I met Dan way back in like 2006 uh, when I was a consultant for Panasonic launching the P2 cameras, uh, the HVX200. And Dan was instrumental in coming up with workflows to help move the data around. But, you know, Imagine's not a giant software company like Adobe. And 
I've emailed Dan and said, you know, Dan, it would be really cool if you guys could do this with your software. And then he'll come back to me usually in a day or two and go, eh, here you go. Here's an update. <laughs> and that's what's cool about working with a company like Imagine. You guys are very responsive to user needs, which is refreshing. Thank you. Right. Yeah, we try really right. hard um, to pay attention to what our customers want. And if we can't do it within 24 hours, that doesn't mean it's not going to get done. It just means that we've added it to the list and we are considering it. Um, we really pride ourselves on customer service. It's something that is important to all of us as consumers in the company. And so we want to, you know, be transparent and pass that on to our users as well. And we are, there is no silly feature request. You know, if you're having an issue, chances are someone else's. So we want to hear about it. And, and if we can, you know, work it into one of our software products, we certainly will. And if we can't, sometimes we develop new software around those. So we did that with TrueCheck a couple months ago. Um, we had a lot of feature requests from ShopPut Pro that just didn't make sense to add into there, but they were valid needs and concerns that people were having. And TrueCheck seemed to be the answer. So we did create a new um, you know, software tool that analyzes and manages, creates reports without doing offloads. Um, you can verify your checksums, do deep searches, things like that. So um, if you're interested, check it out. I didn't mean to make that all salesy, just an example of, of how <laughs> we kind of adapt and kind of roll with things. Then, you know, this industry is forever changing and that keeps us on our toes and we like that. So we're happy to work with our customers as closely as possible. And, you know, what you guys need, we want to provide. So I, I will say that that's a true statement and an honest statement mm -hmm. from you guys. We have maybe perhaps one last question. Uh, Chris Rogers would like to know, will this video be archived and can I watch it again in a month? And he'd also like to know if he can get a copy of the slide deck. And I would say, yes, this is definitely going to be archived. I'm sure it'll be on Imagine's YouTube channel. It'll probably live on Facebook on This Week in Production and perhaps in other places that I don't even know about. But uh, the slides, I suppose we can make those available. I'm not opposed to it. I don't know exactly how. Maybe a Facebook link, or maybe I can give that to Michelle, and you guys could mail that out to your list. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a question on YouTube. Um, is there a quality limit on LTO tapes, HD, 2K, 4K, 6K? I don't think that's it. Yeah, so it's just data. So um, I guess the same would be true as uh, there's no resolution limitation on a hard drive. I mean, the bandwidth to get it off and play in real time is certainly you know a concern, but um, it's just ones and zeros. So the larger the file set, the more uh, tape physical area of the tape it's going to you know occupy. So. As far as I understand, there's there's no limitation to what you can put on an LTO tape. It's just those like we like Art was mentioning the Unix characters. You just have to name the things accordingly so that you know you're not using some invalid character that the base level of the operating system uses in its job. We got a few more questions coming in now. Chris wants to know what was the metadata software that you used prior to the shoot. Tom? Sure. Well, we use, we, it was an old application that Imagine Products developed around the P2 logger days. So that was right, I think, after P2, right after the HVX 200 was introduced. And that's still a great utility. I don't know if it's still available from Imagine Products. And up until recently, we used the P2 CMS from Panasonic. Um, and that has a utility in there to be able to upload metadata for P2. And that was strictly for P P2 cameras as well. Um, but there's a little Catalina issue and they haven't quite caught up to that yet, uh, just based on the software and the older architecture. So, um, but up was one of up those is pieces doing it. of software that I <laughs> talked to Dan about and he wrote it right. cause we needed it. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, I don't think it's still available in the app store. I don't know if it's available on your website, Michelle or not, but it, it is no longer available. I am tickled to death that you guys are still using it. <laughs> Um, no, it's not 
No, it's not something that we've supported for quite a while, actually. I've been with the company six years and I have never supported it. So um, I think it's still great works. though. That, that means, <laughs> yeah, we're doing some th something right because our software is still working yeah. even though we're not technically supporting it yet so, or anymore. So <laughs> We got another question from Lindsay. What product do I need to download two cards at a time on Shotput? I get asked often to do that and I say no. Uh, that that were it that is not a problem with shot put I do it all yeah. the time um, I will I can show you right here you can do multiple cards at a time you can click and drag select I've got a H, uh, a GH5 card and a P2 card they go in there as a group the one thing to make note of is if you have custom naming as a suffix, it will write in that batch to both of the offloads so if you if that doesn't matter, they can go at the same time. I've loaded as many as six cards at one time in one offload batch, and it handles it without a problem. Yeah, I would say all you would need is two card readers to do it at the same time. And that goes back to what right. Tom was talking about earlier, the optimized drive use. Shotput is built for that. That is why uh, mm -hmm. we recommend the optimized drive use so that you can let Shotput decide um, what process to do first and how to split that um, energy, if you will. So you've got some other options in there, but that's the one I always recommend for people is to use the optimized optimize drive use. Uh, and you should have no problem whatsoever doing multiple cards at one time. The, yeah, the I know sometimes. I, say, oh. I was going to say the, the thing on set is that time is money. Right. And for me, getting out of a location, everyone's got to get to the airport, everyone's got to travel. It's not just like, oh, you know, you're going to get home 10 minutes late. Sometimes it's hard stops. So being able to offload as quickly as possible is paramount to my mm -hmm. workflow. We've tried all kinds of different methods, shared storage. You know, we've got some small tree 10 gigabit devices that we can put multiple users on and offload and share. And sometimes that's great, but the faster the disk system, the faster the offload will go. And that's why those new OWC drives are nice because they're quick and they're not terribly expensive. You know, five, six hundred mm -hmm. bucks for a two terabyte drive. And I think now they have four terabyte modules as well. Right. But You're only as not... fast as your slowest conduit, I, I like to say. Yeah. 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 We've got a couple more questions on YouTube over here, guys. Um, we've got a request Great. for spreadsheets to be available. I think that was what Tom was using, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then the, another question, how does checksum PDF work for photos? We do not do thumbnails for photos right now. That might be something we look into in the future. Um, and then which is their preferred checksum method in the field? That um, is a great question. We always recommend XX hash, which is what uh, Joe was using. Um, I would say it depends on where you're at and what your client is requesting or your insurance company. I know that XX hash is um, extremely popular in the United States. It's the fastest checksum to date. Um, MD5 is also a very good one. Um, it's not quite as fast as XX hash. But I know that MD5 is uh, preferred, if not required, in the UK. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, we always recommend XX hash, but do check with, um, like I said, your client, your team, or your insurance company uh, to make sure that they don't have a preference. Yeah, I will say lately, since we've gotten the um, OWC drives, I've been using the file size with the XX hash. And it's been speedy enough of a process to be able to keep cycling cards quick enough to get a ristretto out of the uh, Nespresso machine. <laughs> nice, Tom. <laughs> okay, well, if we're out of questions, I think we will um, wrap this up. I want to thank Michelle from Imagine Products for right. helping to promote this. Can we do one more question? I just have one that came up. Can you talk a bit more about your pre-production process and how you establish a large workflow? Um, Years okay. of experience, right? <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, it's all going to be suited to the needs of the job. And in my uh, productions with this particular client, they're really relying on me to handle those details. They don't really have too many demands for deliverables in certain formats or things like that. I know sometimes with network shows, there's a very specific list of criteria that you need to deliver to them. This workflow is designed for what works for me to manage the whole process. So, and what I do like about the MyLTO and Shop It Pro, these are tools that even though I'm not in front of the DIT stuff all the time and I don't really know every aspect of the software, it's simple enough that if I had to restore tape or if I had to do an archive on set, I could do it and not get hurt. And so this workflow that I've designed works for my needs. And I think that's where you start in designing it is that you have to look at what the deliverables are and what's the most efficient way to do it. If, if time is not a concern, right, you can do all kinds of different variables. If time is a big concern, then you have to start, you know, backing it down from that. Hey, Art, I did see we had a question about the OWC and people were just interested about uh, where to get it and what it is. So I just uh, pulled oh. that up for you. Okay, I'll pop it up. Yeah, OWC is uh, Other World Computers. I have no affiliation to them. I Some of their stuff's been great for me. Some of the stuff's a little wonky, like the docks, the Thunderbolt docks, but their drives mm. seem to be pretty decent. We've had no problems with them. They're fast, they're cheap. The only, I guess, knock that I have against it is that the cable is fixed, doesn't right detach. There, yeah. Sometimes that's good, but sometimes it's a rub. Confidence yeah, issue. We've had, we've had the same with uh, docks versus drives. Their drives seem to be great. I would strongly recommend different docks. That's just my yeah. opinion. <laughs> uh, we've got our one more question. Docks have been the bane guys. of our existence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one more question as far as I can tell. Um, it says, when you copy to two drives at once, why doesn't it slow down? That's a good question, too. Um, because you're reading once and writing, I'm sorry, you're reading once and copying to many, um, and the threads are independent of one another, so the copy doesn't affect the other as far as write speeds go. So, There have been times that we have used hardware raids because there was a speed performance in software raid one and that's typically hardware raid one is the fastest way to make redundant copies but we found that using soft raid with the ssd the the penalty is minimal but you're talking about i think more Michelle reliable than about going internal multiple volumes at the same right time. yeah i think that's what the question was about yeah okay yeah okay are we good okay. i think so all right i just want awesome. to thank everyone for participating michelle tom joe thanks thank, thank you. you yeah thanks okay. everybody and, uh, we'll you let you know it. when the next workflow wednesday is coming i'm guessing a wednesday <laughs> Awesome, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>